And I want to just start by acknowledging um, the fact that we're living in this, a time of stress and video overload. And so um, I just invite you to take a moment and get comfortable. Notice your breath, notice yourself in this space, um, make sure you have what you need in order to be able to take care of yourself for this next hour. Um, and I uh, just want to let you guys know about the next um, webinars in our series. Uh, November 5th, we're going to have a webinar with um, some providers from uh, the clinicas at school based health centers about how they're supporting um, wellness virtually, um, both staff and students. On November 17th, we're going to have a stress reduction uh, yoga class that um, will be recorded and um, it's our intention for it to then be able to be sent out to families um, in the uh, friendly yoga class. Um, today's uh, session is being recorded. Uh, the recording and the slides will be posted on our website in the next few days and be emailed to um, participants. And please feel free to um, ask questions throughout um, and uh, we'll get to them as best we can at the end. And we will be asking for participation um, in today's webinar. And to do that, we invite you to use the chat feature. And it's, um, WebEx has had an update, so I believe it's in the bottom right hand of your navigation bar. There's a little chat bubble. Um, and in order to chat with everyone, um, just make sure that everyone is selected in your who it goes to um, Dropbox. Um, and so just want to introduce a little bit about California School-Based Health Alliance. Uh, we're hosting today's webinar, and our work is based on two basic concepts, um, that healthcare should be accessible and it should be where kids are at. Um, we believe that schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. And we do this through capacity building, technical assistance, workshops, and webinars like today. Um, and there's a link here to go to our website where you can find recording slides and, and register for the other webinars coming up. Uh, we have a membership, um, and if you are a member of uh, the California School Based Health Alliance, you get a discount on conference registration, member-only tools and resources, and technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs. And there's the link here um, if you'd like to sign up. Um, I'm now going to introduce our wonderful presenter today, who we're so glad to have join us, um, Kelly Kanoki. And She's the founder of the Teaching Well, a multi-level systemic approach to bringing wellness back into school systems. In this role, she's mentored thousands, hundreds of teachers, led trainings to thousands, and has built an organization committed to living its values of honest communication, somatic embodiment, and transparency. Kelly recently completed a fellowship with the Transformative Educational Leadership, which brought educational leaders together from across the country to support equitable, large-scale systemic change in K-12 education. A lifelong student of healing, spirituality, and wellness, she has studied with community healers, indigenous elders, mindfulness teachers throughout the Bay Area, New York, New Mexico, and Southern California. She is a certified doula, 400-hour yoga teacher, and has been trained in both the Mindful School and Nairoga Institute's mindfulness program. Um, so we're so excited to have her. And just a quick reminder that we will have an evaluation and pop up on your screen at the end, if you could do that. I'm going to pass it over to Kelly. Hi, y'all. Thank you for that generous introduction. I don't think I've had my bio read in a while. <laughs> like a full mouthful, um, but so kind. And um, welcome everyone who's here. I, I can't see your names in the participant chat, so I'd love if you just took a moment, filled out in the chat your name, what your role is, and what called you to this work, and just call yourselves into the space. We're going to create this together, um, and I'd love to hear who's here. <laughs> I love school-based health clinicians too, Sierra. Thank you. Hi, Patricia. And we have a couple of people who have chatted to the um, host. We have Denise and Vicki, our school nurses. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I might say your name wrong, but Nazi. Um, thank you for introducing us. And I hear that you want to focus on COVID-19. I see us wanting to know more to support health-based clinicians. I see you, Amber. Thank you. Well, I welcome and I welcome this to continue in the chat box. Um, this 60 minute webinar is just an opportunity first to nourish you. Um, we're all here in connection and in service of schools, and it takes something to show up for a webinar in between all of the other things that you are required to do today. And I just, I, I want to ensure that you leave this hour feeling more in connection with yourself and more vital. Um, we are going to have this be an interactive session, so there's going to be times where I'm going to ask you to just, you know, turn off your screen, get connected to yourself. We're going to do some movement together. We're also going to invite some times where you can draw or write. Um, and what I want to invite to and just honor and own in this space that this might be something that you're listening to while you're cleaning your kitchen, or this might be something where you're like, I actually don't have the capacity to write right now. So everything that we're offering today is an invitation. And uh, I really trust that you're taking in this information and taking in this dialogue in the way that's going to enrich your life and enrich the lives of students. Um, and that everything in the ways that we're doing it is going to be just what's needed today. Um, I want to share a little bit more about, oh, I'm going to have to get used to scrolling down, um, who we are. The Teaching Well is a nonprofit wellness organization that was started by teachers for teachers. And we believe that the health and well-being of educators makes a critical difference in school culture. And that ultimately, the ecosystems that we're looking for build the students start with us and start how we, with how we relate to each other. And so a lot of the content that I'm going to be talking about today is going to be talking at a systems level of what does it mean for us to collectively care for ourselves and the people within our, with our colleagues? And then how are we implementing systems of care and rest during work time with colleagues? So it doesn't feel like we need to self-care on the side, but that we're actually integrating all of these tools um, to increase our vitality. The other thing that I want to name is you're going to hear me talk a lot about working with our colleagues. But every tool that we offer today is things that you can apply and redirect um, to work with elementary school, middle school, and high school students. And um, that we actually offer that best when we are living them with each other and with ourselves. So feel free to take any of this work and scaffold it to the needs of your community. Um, and this work also applies to families, okay? And the tenant of the teaching well that I'll briefly touch on is for those of us that um, have a background in public health or in education, uh, we might notice this that looks like similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is our teaching well theory of action pyramid. So we all get into schools, we all become school-based health clinicians because we wanna create thriving school communities for students and families where students, families, and teachers embody excellence and vitality in their lives. They feel interconnected and they feel that they have um, a deepening of their relationship with society because of our work. And that most of the training that we're provided, whether we're school-based health clinicians or teachers, is goes right underneath the surface into this second section of a successful educator community. So how to actually do it. So how to increase fluency, how to build the integrated projects, how to um, increase access to dentist um, appointments, right? And it's the how-to, and that's important, and that should be where a majority of the training goes. But I think anyone who's been on a school site for longer than a week or a year even knows that there's a lot going on underneath the surface that determines whether or not those how-to trainings turn into those thriving school ecosystems or thriving school communities. And so the teaching well imagines its pyramid is like an iceberg, and the teaching well goes underneath the surface to start at the foundation. That each individual adult on campus, their ability to know their stress signals, be aware of their intersectional identity and how their identity interacts with their community, their ability to be responsive and receive feedback on all of that, and their ability to manage their energy through a day, week, year, and career in the work is the foundation to determine whether or not we're able to collectively actualize uh, a thriving school system. 
And then after that foundation, the second step is, do we have the ability to communicate with trust, with respect, with support, our, a, our boundaries, and to have agency to ask for what we need in order to set up the system to be able to be of service to students and families? Um, and so we come and all of this offer, offering today is with the deep belief that healthy people heal systems, systems that are broken and marginalized many, and that healthy systems heal people. And that's our goal and our vision as an organization. And so the agreements were already talked about, so I'll be brief. But do you go to the bathroom, drink, eat, stretch, um, Make sure that you're moving your body and that if things get uncomfortable, that you're taking care of your own personal needs first and foremost. And I know that as teachers, as facilitators, we can't do that all the time. So this is the time you can. I wanna invite you to open, be open to learning. I know I'm talking to experts on this call, people that are experts in their community, expert in their lived experience, um, and maybe have been to maybe train in trauma-informed practices or in collective care. Um, and so I'm really inviting you to maybe see if I'm here, sharing things that you've already heard, hearing them in a new way that meet you in this moment, um, and ensuring that you're staying, you're creating a growth zone for yourself where you feel confident and embodied in your experience, but that there's, uh, you're expanding the edges of what you see possible. And that at any time, if there's something that I share or something that comes up for you as you're doing your reflection where you start feeling overwhelmed, where it feels like it's a trigger or you're feeling a lot of discomfort, I really invite you to just think in your toolkit right now and you can share it in the chat if you want, um, or you can even just give me a thumbs up uh, that you have an exit ramp or a tool you can use to reconnect to yourself and step away from the experience for just a moment so that you can come back into your growth zone and feel connected. I'm gonna just take a couple breaths for us to think of one thing that we could do Maybe that's like turning off the computer sound for a moment. Perhaps it's just putting your feet firmly on the floor. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, taking that time. So where we're gonna start, um, and I guess the final thing to ask for what you need, use the chat box. I'm gonna be following it, but Jess can be following it too. But we're gonna to start today in observation and using a somatic activity. You'll see throughout the teaching world's work that we just really believe the body is intelligent, miraculous, and brilliant. And oftentimes it knows the way before our mind or thoughts is cut up. And so we provide at the teaching world times for us to connect back to our body during virtual meetings in order for us to be able to be our best selves and to be responding from our place of vitality. So we're gonna create an opportunity to observe the whole spectrum of what we're experiencing in this moment by using a tool called peripheral vision. And um, what you're gonna do, and you're, I don't even think anyone can see you on the screen, so you don't need to worry about turning off your video, but you're gonna, I'm gonna have my video on so you can see, um, is that you are going to center your gaze away from your computer and look at something that's about 20 feet away. It can be a, gazed point in your in the middle of your wall, or it can be a, a, a symbol, something that gives you some hope and some joy. And it needs to be at least 20 feet away. And then I want you to center your gaze on it. And then just come back and notice the breath. It may be the first time you've noticed your breath intentionally today. So just taking a moment to thank the breath for doing its thing, even when we don't think about it. And as you keep your gaze focused on something ideally 20 feet in front of you or just across the room, if 20 feet is too far away, I'm gonna invite you to take your two fingers like you're making a picture of that focal point, reaching your arms all the way out in front of you. This is the center of your gaze. And so keeping my gaze exactly where it is, I'm gonna to start to move my fingers out to the outside edges of my vision, moving it to my near periphery or peripheral vision, outside edges of my vision, moving them as far out, where I can keep my focus centered, but I see my thumbs and my fingers outside the edges of my eyes. 
And then I can just move my fingers back and forth. And I'm just activating the peripheral vision while keeping my gaze focused front and center. And then notice the breath. Notice, perhaps, a lengthening of the breath. And then keeping active in your peripheral vision, maybe you put your hands down and notice the light and texture that even though your gaze is focused forward, your brain is still receiving information about. Taking three more breaths with the eyes open. One more breath. And if you feel comfortable and you're able, I invite you to close your eyes and just notice the sensations of the body. Perhaps you notice something that you weren't able to before. Perhaps your senses have heightened. For me, hearing the chime outside my window. One more breath. And then when you're ready, I'm going to invite you to wiggle your fingers and toes, and then you're going to take 30 seconds to just stretch the body. Coming back to the computer at the end of that time and allowing the body to lead the way. What does your body need to stretch for you to show up for the rest of this webinar? All right, coming back. Okay, so that activity took us five minutes, seven minutes, and I can make that shorter. I could make it a little longer, but I probably wouldn't. Um, but this is something that you can use at the beginning of your sessions um, to connect to the body. When we activate our peripheral vision during the day, we're actually activating the parasympathetic nervous system, so that rest and digest part of our system. Um, and as a society and as a virtual COVID-19 society, we are doing things that are beyond our, our body's wildest evolutionary dreams by focusing like 10 inches in front of us and making a lot of meaning <laughs> about some plastic and glass and building relationship. And it's so foreign to the body and um, what actually they found is that when we're staring and when we're at looking at computer screens this long, we actually decrease the amount of times we blink by 30 to 50 percent, which increases the dryness in our eyes um, and it makes it harder for us to focus. So just expanding our gaze in a longer distance fashion, which is more natural for how our body has grown and evolved, you're able to increase your cognitive connection. And then you can come back to the work with new eyes, with a new felt experience in your body. Um, and it's as if your body kind of reset itself. So that's a tool that we can use. Cool, I'm happy that that worked for you, Janet. Thanks for sharing that. And I'd love to hear in the chat what came up for you and feel free to, to dialogue with us and um, share your experience in the chat. So I'm gonna move us to kind of the heart of the content or the concept today. And it's this idea called of herd immunity. So this um, this idea and the framing of this conversation is started in maybe April or May, and I was asked by some school sites or districts of like, well, what can we do to increase well-being? And I had this, I was on a call with a friend, and she was talking about how just being on a call with ten of her girlfriends felt like herd immunity. That by hearing the lived experiences of other people in her life, by being in relationship and being in community, it increased her um, ability to deal with the fear and uncertainty that her family was facing in that moment. And so it gave me this idea. So although, and just some context, herd immunity as a definition is a public health term that says that uh, if a certain amount of the population or a percentage of the population is inoculated to a specific disease, 
um, that everyone in the community has immunity. And then that's based on the herd having collective immunity so that the airborne or the, the, the disease can't pass between people. And so the question that we're going to be holding today and that all of the, the strategies I'm sharing with you are going to be coming from the premise of how do we increase our emotional herd immunity? So how can we inoculate our community from the fear, uncertainty, change that's going on that's out of our locus of control by building the resilience of how we work together with ourselves, with each other, and how we build systems that support that care? Um, and so that is the premise and what we're holding today. Um, and when I use the word herd immunity, that's what I'm going to be meaning. Um, and a huge part of the concept of herd immunity um, and the, a thing that I think we grapple with in the education system is how do we provide collective care? So how do we create systems that care for all people and that don't marginalize folks? And if they do, how do they include them? Um, and so much of our systems marginalizes so much of our of everyone's experience um, and has explicit perpetuated oppressive impacts on um, on many communities, uh, specifically along lines of race and class. And so the context of what I'm going to share with you today, I'm going to share this this concept of collective care as a way to herd immunity. I really want to acknowledge that, this knowledge and this concept really comes from land-based indigenous communities who have been passing this message through lineage over time to share these healing modalities and way of being in right relationship with nature, with themselves, with each other. And the question I'm going to be asking us today is how can we take that, how can we be with that knowledge and influence it and shift our systems that are not doing that for so many of us, okay? So this concept of collective care in the way that I've experienced it has this like cyclical effect. And um, I'm gonna let, give you some time to just look at this image. And then I'm gonna kind of explain how this can be broken down or this can be, we can be with this and see it inside of our school systems or inside of our health, uh, our clinic um, or inside of our district. So when I think about what we're looking for from the education system for our students, um, for our families, for educators, is what is, the, what is the way that we can allow individuals to be supported by the school system to have access to their unique gifts, their unique gifts of listening, their skills that they'll then be gifting society in the future, and the truth of their lived experience and feeling confident enough to share those. And oftentimes we are like, well, how do we get them to access their gifts? And what I'm going to invite is that in a collective care society, the gift of the individual is actually the last part of the cycle. And that the cycle initially actually starts with reverence. So when I'm using the word reverence, I'm, I'm really meaning having awe for just being, being here right now and for what has happened in the system in the past, and then who we're building the system for, or how we're building the system for future generations. Um, and so that includes those ancestors who have held it or have shifted the system, so it's more equitable today. Um, how our systems relate to nature, and how nature tends and cares for us through all, so many ways, but <laughs> the food system, through our surroundings, through the air we breathe, the water we drink. And then what is, can we have reverence and awe for those who will come after us who have never experienced this work before or who, whose ideas we can't even fathom because it's going to be beyond our complexity of thinking, right? And how can we hold that reverence as we start building and tending to our systems and have that be the focal point? So the way that I apply that to my work and maybe the way that you can apply it to yours um, is that this, the reverence I have for this session today that I'm adding in the chat box is um, I want to lift up a couple voices that found this work. So Adrienne Marie Brown wrote a book on emergent strategy where she's looking to create liberatory systems similar to this collective care model um, inside institutions um, to liberate ourselves. 
and this community. Reza Menachem wrote a book called My Grandmother's Hands and How Racialized Trauma Lives in the Body of All People and How to Use the Body to Find Freedom and Liberate Ourselves from Racial Oppression. Uh, I watched a movie recently called Aluna that was directed by the Kogi, Kogi people of the Sierra Madre Mountains, where they're trying to share, they call themselves elder brothers and trying to share with younger brothers the environmental impact of the way that we live. And their work is very connected to collective care. Um, and then I also lift up my team members who, through our community and conversation, lift up this work. So maybe you want to just take a moment and write on your sheet of paper. Um, who, what is the knowledge, the inspiration of people in the past and the people in the future that have you choosing to be a school-based health clinician or have you choosing education and that you believe the system is the way to go? We'll just take one minute and you're welcome to share it in the chat box if you like, but if you're a hand writer, I know I am, this use this time for you. knowing that you can talk, right, while I'm talking, and then take a moment and move us to gratitude. So gratitude is reverence in action. If we know that our work at the school system, our work at our school site is based on many people who came before us and is for many people who will come after us, we can have gratitude for all things big and small. And in that gratitude, we can find um, space and compassion for ourselves as we're growing and learning as leaders and as service providers. Um, and it's also, it's based, uh, it has a connection to the PBIS role of five to one, which tells the story that for every one negative interaction you have with a kid, you need to have five positive interactions in order to balance that because we all, as humans, have a bias towards negativity. A negativity bias is what it's called. Um, and so gratitude is a way for us to build that herd immunity and build that inner resilience to see the beauty and miracle that is in our lives right now and to find beauty inside the complexity and pain and challenge and discomfort that we often have to experience being in, um, being in service um, in society today. And so maybe you take some time to write out what you're grateful for big and small. So that means people. That also means uh, your computer working, <laughs> your internet provider. Um, it can mean your young child or the plants that are in your office. And maybe you don't even write those aloud, but maybe you just close your eyes and think about what you're grateful for and visualize it. And if it's a person not here in the room, I just want to invite you to see, imagine their face if you were telling them this gratitude in person, how they might receive your love, how they might receive your admiration, and how that gratitude passes between people. Beautiful. And when gratitude is present and reverence is the foundation, then it's just so easy to, instead of thinking of fixing or saving the systems we're a part of or reacting to the systems we're a part of, it's, we can think of it as tending. How do we tend to the people in our community? How do we tend to the school site we are on? How do we tend to things in order to be in right relationship to them? And this is the heart of where generative conflict happens, which is a frame from the transformative justice work of Miriam Kabe, uh, Adrian Marie Brown, and Prentice Hemphill. And generative conflict as a term is this idea that 
conflict is a natural part of us building and growing as, as humans. And oftentimes as a society, uh, we think of conflict as, as something that breaks relationships. And so generative conflict is an intentional term to use conflict to build relationship or build bridges. And so when we're tending to people rather than fixing, saving, or reacting to them, that is an opportunity for us to build bridges or to see ourselves as part of the same ecosystem. And we might go into later into like how to do that actually, um, but I'll hold there. So it's, it's a split from this merit-based score and assessment based ideas that we have in the education system and it's this flip to how do we use schools as spaces to tend, which I know is the heart of the school based health movement. So I know I'm speaking to, to Kin. Um, and when we tend and we have gratitude, individual people's gifts emerge. And they're not emerging for fear of not being enough, but they're emerging because they feel worthy, seen and heard. And so then they're able to speak their truth and they're able to generate new innovative ideas that only their truth and their lived experience can offer us. And the second thing is they're able to listen to diversity, diverse perspectives. So I don't, if I know that each person has an individual gift, I don't need everyone's gift to look like mine. And I don't need them to do it my way to validate my personal experience, right? And so that biodiversity is actually what's going to create a transformed, liberated system, which is the one that we want to bring. Um, and so I, I, I just want you to maybe take a moment and type in the chat box of this idea of who is somebody in your life? Maybe it was a teacher in the past. Maybe it's your partner. Uh, maybe it's a, a mentor or a friend who allowed your gifts to emerge just by who they, how they showed up for you and what it felt like to have your inspiration, this natural desire to create be the way forward. Yeah. And there we are back at reverence. Yes, I see you, Jeff and Tracy. Yeah, we can definitely embrace this notion in all aspects of our lives. And so that's the cycle. And the question is just like, how do we apply that to our certain system now or where are the gaps in our system now? And I'm gonna have two slides to connect to that. Um, and I also am gonna invite you that if you have questions about what I'm bringing up here to write in the chat box now and over the next five minutes, I'll kind of come back and Jess, um, I'm gonna get Jess's perspective too after the second, these next two slides. So what a beautiful thing we just talked about, this collective care work. And collective care is all that's needed when a society is in right relationship, both inside itself and outside of itself. It is a, think of it as like a biome or an ecosystem that is in balance. And therefore it nourishes itself with both its beautiful new creations and the decay of old systems. And it holds a feedback loop. For itself. Okay, and that's really based in like kind of ecological context. Uh, Joanna Macy is amazing at connecting organizations to ecological frameworks. So if you want to check out her work, she's great. And so when we talk about self care, which is a huge part of the teaching wells work, we want to be really clear that in a collective care community, self care is not needed. Because in a collective care community, you are nourished and tended inside of your system and you tend to nourish the system. But as we make our way there, as we make our way on the arc between collective care and the individual capitalist society we currently live in, self-care is a necessary and vital distinction specifically for care providers when society is built to always ask for more. Okay. And so the work that we're doing today is to, to find, to care for ourselves and then also care for each other so that that collective care, that vision can come forward. And self-care is one of the things that we'll get there and um, us advocating for our self-care is what is going to, one of the ways that will allow us that collective care vision. 
And so I will, um, I want to pause here and I just want to maybe lift Jess's voice of what in the last few slides has resonated with you and, you know, what curiosities, what are, what's connecting to your personal experience? Um, I was a little like, whoa, self-care is not even needed if we are in a space or in a society that actually takes care of each other. That was a little bit of a like, surprise to me and I'm, I'm sitting with like how far we are from that um, I think and how important it is and then I said in the chat also but just that shift of uh, helping or fixing but really just even when you say the word tending it feels so much more caring and like we're all in this together mm -hmm. so I'm just appreciating that that's what we about to me. Mm. I, I love that, and and it's not that people wouldn't individually care for themselves in a system, but that it wouldn't need to be a distinction that we prioritize. You know, we wouldn't need to remind people, especially care providers in an individual cap in the society we're currently living. We are often asked to do more with less, and care providing our emotional labor or care for all citizens is considered optional or something that's underfunded, and so us actually having prioritizing our self-care in this moment is actually a vital pathway to collective care. Um, but in a system that nourishes all beings as its primary source first before creating profit for individuals is, uh, will be a place where the, the concept of needing to care for yourself or prioritize self-care won't, won't be needed in the same way. Yeah. I'm just listening. If you want to check out the chat, everyone, Amber wrote, um, the thing that stood out to me is feeling appreciation for my child and imagining how they'd respond by feeling my appreciation for them. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's so, it's so beautiful. They've done, they've done, um, I'm like going to talk about some science, but they, they've done studies where they place like a, a, a word or phrase or they speak loving thoughts to plants or they say loving things to plants and they watch how they differently they grow. And it's been shown that if you put phrases of like love, kindness on water, but you put sugar crystals in it, it crystallizes differently than if you put negative words on it. Um, and then similarly with plants, like that's like a, one of the things I did when I was in middle school, like saying loving things to your plants while you're giving them the basics of water actually increases their, over across the class would increase how well those plants did, you know? And so I think about, I think about that with adults that it's just so much harder to do sometimes, more so committed to serving school students and families and community for us to give that same level of layer of love and appreciation to each other and to ourselves. Um, and how, when we do feel that love and appreciation, how much more we flourish and how much, how much more we'd be able to create for, um, for our future generations. I think it ties into what Tracy was commenting that about tending and that teachers inherently tend to their kids, um, but don't know that our workplaces really do this so well with adults. Mm hmm. Yeah. And and I think that's so beautiful. And, and for me, that feels like my, my my calling or my call to all of us is like, how can we how can we provide that self tending first? Because we're in a society that under tends care providers. And then how can we give that same tending and compassion to our colleagues? knowing that when that love is present, when that reverence and gratitude is present, it's and the tending allows those people, allows all of us to, to emerge our gifts that can't be boxed, that can't be put in a curricula or formula, right? But that actually emerge to meet the need of their community, of your individual community. Yeah. All right. So, I'm looking at time and um, I want to, I want to get a pulse in the group and I also would love to give us a couple minute break 
Um, and uh, Jess is going to send you a link to a to an ocean ocean video, and it's. Uh, um, it, initially, I was trying to find a video of the ocean that is my home, which is the San Diego Ocean um, in La Jolla and um, and in the Pacific Beach. In Pacific Beach, but um, in this time, I'd like to ask the question of: Are you interested in learning more about when people don't feel tended to, when people are reactive or not listening, or you feel disconnection? How to help your community and help yourself stay connected? That's one option. And then option two is like, what are systems you can put in place to enhance collective care into agendas or into the larger system than the one-on-one -on -one system to uh, support your school community? So one is like individual conflict, how to be in generative conflict. And two is systems that you can use every day, whether there's a conflict or not. And if you can put a one or two in the chat box, we'll come back together. I'm gonna invite you to stretch, draw, breathe, just take it in, see what digests for you, and we'll come back in. I'm going to just give us two minutes. Uh, so we'll come back at 143 or 144. Taking 30 more seconds and coming back to the computer when you're ready. My hair is super special right now. <laughs> There's a beautiful wind coming through my window right here. Well, thank you, Nazi. I appreciate that. And I've got one for one and one for two. Is there someone that's willing to be a one? Okay, Jill. Jill, feel the deal. If you haven't added your voice yet to one or two, I'd love to. Love to make sure that your voice can be heard in the next five or ten seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm hearing this desire for session one, section one, and uh, no, and I'm going to put my information in the chat box right now. 
that you can reach out to me if you um, want to know more information about the section two. So these are like some systems you can put in place in agendas, but it looks like we're looking for one um, about when conflict and disagreement arises. Okay, I'm going to go there. Oh, and this is missing a juicy flag. Okay. So I think the thing I want to say is that, okay, I'm going to start here. Um, when we're talking about um, generative conflict and when we're talking about collective care, here's the connection. When there is a gap between how the system can care for individuals and how much capacity individuals have to care for themselves. So basically when we do not have a collective care model and there's a gap between the system and the individual's ability to care for their needs, there is a gap for conflict and a gap for people to react from a survival response or a little t trauma response. So that might look like um, having disagreements or conflicts, feeling angry when you leave a meeting or having someone's anger take over a whole meeting and distract from student outcomes. It could look like um, a person leaving the Zoom or turning off their video and not participating in a flight response. Or it can look like some, you're like giving great ideas and great uh, directions and that your team's just unable to take in the information. It's like a freeze response. Um, and or you feel this, all of these apply to ourselves too. So when I wanna like get angry at one of my team members or um, or I am feeling like I want to avoid this kind of tension that's maybe happening between me and client or me and my partner for that matter, or when I get overwhelmed and I can't take any more of a session. These are all the happenings that when I'm like in a system that's caring for me at the base that it can possibly have and the gap between me and the way I can care for myself. And so when you have someone acting out of character, when you are acting out of character, um, these are tools that, uh, that my, te my team uses and that I use in order for both of us to ground into our bodies or to connect to our body and come back to our collective, collective values that drew us both to work at this school site or in this organization. So the first one, the biggest gift I can offer is on the slide right now, which is pause. The gift of silence um, or that space between the, the what you're receiving from somebody and then how you react. The pause can make the difference between that being a reaction versus that being a response. And especially, and I just want to really name, especially with in my organization, I'm the executive director. And so I hold a lot of positionality and power along lines of race, class and where I sit inside the system of my organization. And so my ability to be responsive and to receive feedback is a really vital ingredient for, uh, for, my, for my organization to attempt collective care. So if you have that power and positionality, it's, these are even more important tools, potentially more important tools for you. So when I'm in that pause, when something's happened that feels, um, that reacts, creates a sensation in my body, I just, I take a moment and I can say something like, wow, I'm going to just take a deep breath. Let me, take, let me sit with what you've just shared with me. And I might not even put the wow there. I'm going to sit with what you just shared with me. Or you might norm in all of your meetings, like silence is okay. So in education world, like teacher wait time. But it's okay to, for a question to be asked or for in a moment of conversation for there to be silence. And that my need to fill that space is less important than me connecting to my breath and connecting to myself with what do I feel in my body and then what is this person asking for, okay? And how is this connected to our values? So it could be simple just as a silence. And then if you're having a hard time responding, I press my feet into the floor, anchoring into my feet, into, um, Placing my hands on my legs just helps me stay in my experience rather than in someone else's, okay? The second thing that I do as a leader is I acknowledge. So I, I choose that the first thing that I'm offering 
whenever I'm sharing is a is acknowledgement of what has been said to me rather than me responding or or reacting to what was said. So I'll I'll take the time and it might it might it takes 10 seconds, 30 seconds to just be like, can I can I repeat what I heard so that I have clarity on what you were sharing? And that's not a time for me to interpret their words and make meaning there. It's the time for me to repeat key phrases to say, is that what you is that what you said? Did I catch it right? Okay. And acknowledgement is also a time to acknowledge context. To acknowledge that there might be other things that are in play that are causing us to be in, in, in dissonance or in misalignment or in conflict. Right? So this might be a pattern that you have with a team member around past experiences. This might be an aspect of power and positionality and past experiences that that they or you have had in the roles that you sit in. Um, and then there's other intersectional identity markers like race or class that might be allowing people not to listen to each other. So I'm acknowledging that in that space. And so I'm reclaring, validating, honoring, and then appreciating that they were willing to, to show up as they were willing to receive that feedback. Okay. And then the next thing that I do, and this is not all, you know, it looks like steps, but I just invite that these are tools that I use, and I use them in all different ways, <laughs> um, is to connect. So I, I use my, I, I notice my eye contact, my tone of voice, my body language, and I ask myself, am I building bridges that allow listening for them to feel listened to and for me to be listened to, where I'm tending to our relationship? And how am I connecting that relationship so that it feels that this is not just our first moment because it's an intense moment, but that this, that this intense moment was allowed to be because of our past experiences together. Okay. And then in this responding, I want to be really clear that the responding context is really from like if someone has a need from you or if you've caused harm or if someone has, is like expecting something from you that these are tools that I use to respond in order to allow for that person to feel heard and for us to move forward in our vision for students and families. So one, I provide clarity. If I can, I provide a timeline and I provide a direct response to the underlying need, even if, even if it comes with a lot of emotion, right? Or even if it comes in a way that feels disconnected, if I can, what is the underlying need and can I directly respond to that or create timeline for it? Two, can I create options? This is something that, um, that I, as a sixth and seventh grade teacher, I felt like was once I was able to offer options in my classroom that I just was able to build deeper relationships with my students. And um, I now <laughs> offer this in all, all areas of my life, um, you know, and partners and at work included. And options are great because they increase agency. They allow that person to look within and be like, what, what do I actually want? What do I need? What is the, what is the way I want to move forward? And then secondly is I offer support and a network of knowing that we maybe are in conflict right now, but there might be other people in our community that can provide the answer that I might not be able to offer. So how am I offering connections and lines of contact across the school community? to be able to um, know that this conflict or this tension that happened is not just about us, it's about the collective ecosystem having a gap in how it's caring for its people. And so how do I expand who's holding that tension so that we can all resolve it and heal it together? And then the third one that goes back to the collective care wheel is compassion. If I'm tending a relationship rather than fixing, saving, or reacting to a relationship, I can have gratitude that, that we're in conflict and we're still in relationship. I can have reverence for who came before us that we're able to have this difficult conversation and still show up for students the next day. Um, and I can also know that we're just tending a relationship, that this isn't the make or break of our relationship, and that we can try again tomorrow. So compassion is what allows me to hold all of those things while uh, being in relationship with someone else. And so what I invite for us, and I'd love for you to free write and place this in the chat, of what is a time where you've used one of these tools and it's given you a, you know, 
It's allowed you to build relate, build bridges across conflict. And then maybe sharing where's a moment where one of these tools may have reduced harm in a conflict. Um, and if none of these questions call to you and you're like, actually, I have a question, <laughs> I'm going to put that in the chat. Please put it in the chat. You've got about five minutes to explore this. All right. I don't see any questions or comments in the chat, although I do feel like there's connection between what Amber shared um, of finding out what the space needs are in the pause and acknowledge segment. But I'd love to hear maybe from Jess of where have you noticed this as a school, a former social worker at schools, and um, and where are the, how could you use one of these tools perhaps, or how have you? Yeah, well, I think I'm thinking about a couple of things. One um, actually came up recently um, in our in our agency. We've been doing a lot of exploration around um, equity and racial justice and what that looks like in our uh, in our coworkers. And I'm just just thinking about a time that I think I um, didn't use these tools as well as I would have liked, and um, you know, I got triggered and then was more defensive and reactionary rather than um, pausing and just trying to hear the other person's perspective. And so I think it comes up all the time. And then if I think back to working at schools, I mean, I think it comes up with parents a lot. I think there's a lot of really stressful situations. And um, it can be easy to get defensive rather than um, just taking the moment to actually see what they're, where they're coming from and that it's not personal. Mm -hmm. So, like thinking about that, this is due to a, a gap um, in our ability to care for each other and one another. It just makes it so much, takes it into a place of being able to not be, take it personally. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that connection. Um, yeah. And that ability to not take it, to allow, to be with someone's emotions and not personalize it or feel. Yeah, to not personalize it is a really, um, it's a powerful gift. And it's something to practice. It's not natural to the body, because the body, Prentice Hemphill talks about this really beautifully, is that your body can't distinguish between a conflict and between a lion chasing you. It responds the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we haven't had practice in conflict, and we, and that system doesn't actually care for all people in it, and, and then there's, then, conflict happens and we just don't have the same skills. So these tools are just about giving ourselves skills to calm our body and be with dissonance and find a way to bridge, to bridge a gap in a new way. I'm looking at Janet's comment. Thank you for sharing that. 
Mm, you're welcome, Janet. And that pause and connection are the ones that you use. Yeah. Yeah. And the one thing I want to share for, for us as service providers, and then we'll close out because it's exactly two, is that sometimes we're, you know, often, and I speak for myself, but speak from, from experiences I've had with others, is often we actually utilize these very well in our relationships with students and families. And then when it comes to that co colleague we don't like, or when it comes to our boss, or when it comes to, for me, it was like my partner, I like did not have time to pause. I was like, I've been pausing all day. Let me tell you what I really feel <laughs> over here. Um, and so that, I just want to like hum hum humanize the experience of this as like a learning and growing process. And that like, it's not uh, about doing it right all the time, but that even more important that if we're, if we are often having to like, to sit with other people's feelings, that it's actually really important that we invest time in our own personal space to be able to move our feelings through. So like examples of like, I have a difficult conversation with a team member and then I get off the call and I like, I actually threw my meditation cushion down on the ground like 10 times. I was so, I had so much anger in my body. I was like, boom, like throw it down, throw it down. And it was a way for me to express the anger in my body that was my like reaction to the dissonance without creating more dissonance by getting angry with my team member who I really care about and who's lifting something that's going to help us be a better system, right? So not about suppressing our feelings as much as finding new ways to care for our feelings and then care for relationships together. All right. I'm going to pass it back to Jess, and then I'm willing to stay on for questions, but I don't know if there's any other closing. I could share a little bit, but if you want to get us to know us more as an organization, the teaching where we do, we do activities like this for school sites, for districts, for um, health centers as well, and that um, in the slide, there's um, a closing survey that you can share, and I know maybe Jess has one to share, um, and you can find about our work at the Teaching Well uh, website. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Kelly, for this wonderful um, presentation. And I got a lot out of it. And I just have the slide up here that if anybody has any questions, that's my contact. That's Kelly's contact. And she posted her website. And so please um, reach out. And if anybody has a question, um, also Kelly can stay on with her. Um, and we just really appreciate your participation today. Thank you, everyone. Oh, and yeah, uh, an evaluation will pop up on your screen, so please fill it out. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. Have a wonderful day.